welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a lacrimose Charles Coulomb. Lacrimose? You mean tearful? Sad? Because of having to spend Christmas in the hospital? Post-op? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was visited by 59 ghosts of Christmas past. That sounds exhausting. It was, actually. <laughs> but it, no, I, I, those are the Christmases I remember. 59, starting with Christmas of 1963. Wow. Can you imagine? Hmm. And what a long slew of Christmases it has been. And what I miss, both from the Christmases of my childhood in New York and my childhood and youth in L.A., the Santa Claus Lane Parade and the Macy's at Hollywood Broadway window displays for Christmas and the old Christmas lights that were painted. You still see them, you know, when you drive around. Some of the houses still have them. And I, those, I'm sorry, those are real Christmas lights for me. That's the real thing. This other stuff, I don't know. That, so. um, and family and friends were no longer with us. And I made, although I was trapped in hospital, it wasn't, it was a very reflective Christmas. You know, I made several phone calls to friends and relatives that were quite long. And when the uh, when Holy Communion was brought me, I burst into tears. It was the I was really lacrimose. It was the the best Christmas gift I could have had. And the same thing happened the following two days. Uh, I finally got out of the hospital on the twenty eighth, and uh, I've been back here ever since. But it's only been recently I've been able to sit upright. So I'm slowly recovering. But it was a very thoughtful thing. And then we had a few friends. Uh, I had a few friends over physically. And uh, there was sort of a Zoom call with L.A. friends put together by my nephew, Charlitos. And we rang in the new year and sang Old Lang Syne. But the real celebration uh, externally for me was last night. A goose dinner here. And... Uh, we had the uh, the king cake afterwards, and one of our number was king, and demanded to be entertained, as in accordance with custom. So different people sang songs or danced or whatever, and then to close off the evening, we sang uh, "God Rest You Merry Gentlemen" and "Old Lang Syne." But you can imagine that uh, having been deprived of so much of my usual Christmas cheer. I'm rather keen on celebrating the Epiphany Octave and keeping the season going all the way until Candlemas. And that includes four, count of four, late January observances. January 21st, the death of King Louis XVI, which in France and elsewhere is commemorated by Requiem Masses and the reading of his will and consecration of France to the Sacred Heart. Then on the 25th is Robert Burns, the birthday of the great Scottish poet Robert Burns, which is commemorated around the world with Burns Night Suppers, uh, which are really wonderful events if you've ever been to them or even if you haven't. Then on the 28th, my name day, Blessed Charlemagne, which is uh, was celebrated liturgically these days only in different parts of Germany. And then, of course, the 30th, the day that Charles I was murdered by the Puritans, which for Anglo-Catholics is a uh, holy day for Catholic admirers and so on. It's a day to remember the White King. And then we shall be to, January, to February 1st, St. Bridget's Day, Candlemas Eve, and then Candlemas, which is really the end of uh, the season. Although there are a few rays of Christmas that continue through Mardi Gras season. What, what, what's the last gasp of Christmas you've said? 
I would say the very last gasp, and this will get people upset and excited, Mm -hmm. is Midnight Ash Wednesday. Wow. When Mardi Gras ends, Christmas is definitely, definitely over. Because you see, the Mardi Gras season uh, sort of begins with the Epiphany and is certainly underway in a lot of places by Candlemas. So there's a lot of overlap between the larger Christmas season and the Mardi Gras season. I see. But <laughs> midnight, midnight, the end of uh, the 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 end of Mardi Gras, the beginning of Ash Wednesday. That's it. No more Christmas. Mm. It is gone. But oh. This year, I'm going to hold on to as much of it as I can. Good. I'm going to fight to hold on to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So the plan for this episode is we're gonna do we're gonna do some memes of production, and then we're gonna do state of the week, and then we're going to do. Um, we felt it was fitting to do sort of a tribute to Pope Benedict. We haven't talked about Pope Benedict in a long time, unfortunately, um, and um, I feel like he's. Uh, been such an important figure i feel like in both of our lives um so we'll give some commentary on that um there's a lot to talk about in my opinion um and that'll be the show all right so let us start with the memes of production nationalize the memes of production for the common good all right so what do we got here we've got some we've got some interesting things here i'm not gonna lie charles um so we did a video. I, I put out sort of a, a mini video um, from a previous full episode uh, on the question of does the Holy Roman Empire still exist? And Charles did such a good answer. I want to do a little video uh, on its own. And Dylan says, maybe the real Roman Empire was the friends we made along the way. <sighs> I hope Dylan lives in California because that, yeah. That's the kind of answer you'd hear in, you know, Topanga Canyon or Ojai. <laughs> Just sort of a, a blissed out approach. <laughs> I like that. There's nothing uh, wrong with being blissed out. I love that. Um, what do we got here? We got uh, just a shout out to Katie, uh, who is a super fan and on Twitter. He Great Twitter post right here. She says, uh, Jude's keeping warm with his best Christmas gift of the day. Yes, he put the books like that. You know you can get free shipping on orders over $30 at TumblrHouse.com. Was that a plug? Mm. Good question. Was that a plug? I don't know. Good looking kid right there, especially in that Tumblr House uh, hoodie. Uh, what a beautiful case. I can tell. Actually, so he's, she's got Bless Charles of Austria, Vickers of Christ, Ghost Book. Um, Mass in his folklore, and I can see right next to his head. I know what that is, Katie. That is Dom Garanger's liturgical year. I have the exact same. Published uh, by Loretto Press. I think you can get the whole calendar for maybe 500, 600 bucks. Um, so that's a great, that's a great picture there. Um, yeah, and it shows someone who's willing to invest in their children. Absolutely. And you can get sort of uh, Tumblr House gear, uh, the merchandise um, on the, our Patreon, our, not our Patreon store, excuse me, our Teespring store. We have the links in in uh, the description. You can get, um, you know, Tumblr House gear, but we have a lot of Habsburg stuff, a lot of Sacre Coeur stuff, um, and a lot of Sacred Heart stuff. I, I really like wearing, uh, I've ex- said this before, I really like wearing a Sacred Heart t-shirt uh, as I walk because that sort of gets to evangelize. You know, you just walk around and, and people see what you stand for and all you need to give them is a smile. And they that sort of, you know, creates an association there, right? Like Catholics are friendly. Sacred um, Heart makes you smile. Sacred Heart makes you smile, yeah. Um, so this last one is a little bit unusual, Charles. You may want to pay attention because uh, it involves you heavily. 
I got an anonymous tip that there's um, your Wikipedia page has been updated. So I, I don't know if you, you want to look at that. Um, I, I rarely look at my Wikipedia page, but all right, let's have a yeah, look. Let's give it a look, huh? I, uh, let's I don't know how it works, but people update it and sometimes add and subtract weird things. Yeah. Charles J. Coulomb, uh, well, the I, EU founding father. I feel like people mostly do a good job, huh? Um, I feel like, um, I mean, we've had some problems. There have been some weird, like from your detractors, you know? But um, I feel like it's it's pretty good. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Is there something? Is there something Ever near the bottom? Uh, yeah. Is there something Ever on the bottom here? Wait, what's this last line? Uh, read it for us, Charles. Um. <laughs> Wait, what? Ever a champion of causes forgotten by many or seen as bizarre, Coulomb was not only in favor of restoration of monarchy. But also timeless classics such as Charmaine Sandwiches and Tequila and Ovaltine. Wow. That's the final thought on the Wikipedia page. That That's the taste that people are left with after reading what Charles Coulomb is all about. Don't you be editing that. Don't you be editing that. I, you look, I don't you know, have a I don't know look. how to edit it. Look, it's settled. It's settled. <laughs> the matter is settled. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to edit it. Uh, <laughs> what is vulture? What? Oh yes, they did interview me. Uh, yeah, I have been interviewed by vulture. It's true. Ha. Huh. Look, okay, people are not supposed to edit their own posts. So you're actually violating the terms of service if you are doing what I think you're doing. I'm not. I'm looking okay. uh, vulture. So who really is the youngest pope of all time? This is back in 2017. I forgot about this. That's right. I was... Um, uh, yeah. So who is actually the youngest pope in history? Well, put on your chastity belts and get ready to meet Pope Benedict the Ninth. An enfant terrible who ruled from 1032 basically to 1048. It's complicated. At the end of an era known as the pornocracy. Vulture spoke to Charles Coulomb, historian and author of several books, uh, including Vickers of Christ, the History of the Popes, to get to know the truly young Pope, who was once called a demon from hell. <laughs> wow. The, um, uh, so I was asked, what was his role like? Um, well, how did such a bad Pope get elected in the first place? My response was basically it was a uh, nepotistic appointment so that his father, Albert III, could maintain control over Rome. Something you have to understand about the Pope at that time was that he was both the spiritual ruler of Christendom but also the temporal ruler one of Rome. Up until 1870, the, the papacy was responsible for the city of Rome and its environs, said Coulomb. In addition to his religious duties, he also had responsibility for the welfare of the Romans. Pope Benedict IX was a descendant of the former ruler of Rome, Theophylact I, who was born Theophylactus of Tusculum, and his appointment was the way for the family to maintain power. Quote, the quote is me, his father was the lord of the city, and he basically bribed the Romans to elect his son. If you vote for him, I'll pay you. If you don't, I'll kill you. Your choice, which would you prefer, said Coulomb. You maintain control over Rome by maintaining control over the Pope. Okay, was his rule... Um, uh, was what was his rule like? He was very dissolute, said Coulomb. He was a rapist, he was a murderer. Even after the pornocracy, he really set a new low. He also neglected his religious duties. When you're busy raping and murdering, you often don't have time for everything. Wow. Well, you don't. There aren't a lot of specific accounts, but as Pope Victor III wrote in his dialogues, Benedict the Ninth's sins included rapes, murders, and other unspeakable acts of violence and sodomy. His life as a pope was so vile, so foul, so execrable, Pope Victor III wrote, that I shudder to think of it. And then the, um, uh, then the question was, I've heard that he was the first gay pope. Is that true? My response was, well, not quite. In part, this is not a logical question. Gay is a relatively modern identity and it certainly didn't exist in the minds of popes and peasants in the 11th century. 
But if you're asking if Pope Benedict the Ninth had sex with men, he did. The other guy says, was he hot? My response was, make your own call. Wow. Uh, the, um, this is, um, what was the end of his life like? Apparently, evil men can have pretty peaceful ends. He died very peacefully, and you might say penitently, in the abbey in Grotoferrata, said Coulomb. When he died, the people who knew him were quite pleased with him, including the abbot of the place. And then the guy uh, says, wow, this all sounds like it could be a TV show. No kidding. So, yeah, I'd forgotten that I was interviewed by Vulture, but there it is. I suppose it's useful to, uh, it is useful to look up your own Wikipedia article now and then. Hmm. Even if you get stuck with chow mein sandwiches and tequila and Ovaltine. Stuck with chow? I thought you liked chow mein sandwiches. I do, but obviously someone is trying to palm them off on me as though I'm the whole chow mein sandwich thing. It's not true. It's a self-existing, independent thing, which I am grateful to serve. I don't think that was that implication at all. It said it's a timeless classic, not bound to you at all. Oh, You're just good. a supporter. I am a supporter. <laughs> Tequila and Ovaltine, maybe not so much. <laughs> all right. Uh... But, but Tom and Jerry is going way bad. <laughs> All right, are you ready for the State of the Week? I are. State of the Week is the great state of Mississippi. Not that Mississippi, interesting. Don't yeah, yeah. Well, I have to say Mississippi is a state I'm very fond of. But my experience of Mississippi is very limited. In other words, the only areas in Mississippi I know very well are the Gulf Coast, and the area around Natchez and Jackson. So I have to focus on those two areas because that's all I know. So if you're from Meridian or Hattiesburg or Florence or the Mississippi Delta, Yachtapotafa County, uh, other than Corinth, Mississippi, which I've also been to, I really, so we'll just hit those three areas. Starting in the South, uh, Biloxi is part of the Gulf Coast, and there are other places, Pascagoula, home of the great, uh, the great Mississippi squirrel revival. Uh, Biloxi, of course, is a French town. There are other places like uh, Delisle and, um, gosh, I can't think of the other one. But uh, there are a lot of French and other interesting people settled there. Uh, Biloxi also boasts the uh, Cathedral of the Redeemer, which is quite lovely. Uh, and the former home, it's gone now, it was destroyed in Hurricane uh, Katrina, but the, it boasted the home of uh, Father uh, John Ryan, not John Ryan, Father, um, I can't think of his first name, but the poet priest of the, of the Confederacy lived there. Uh, Beauvoir is near there, and Beauvoir is where um, Jefferson Davis lived his, fat, his last few years. So it's the Jefferson Davis Museum and Presidential Library, and really, really worth seeing. If you want to get a feeling for the Confederacy and for how they viewed themselves and how Jefferson Davis viewed himself, definitely go to Beauvoir. Plus, you can enjoy seeing his rosary and scapula there. Uh, Natchez, Mississippi, on the on the yeah, on the Mississippi River, beautiful homes, antebellum homes, uh, St. Mary's Basilica, which the parish was founded in 1792 under the Spanish. Natchez is a beautiful, beautiful town, uh, and well worth seeing. But. Up the road is Jackson, Mississippi, which is the capital of the state. And the Capitol building is the biggest thing to see there. From there, we'd have to go way to the northern end of the state, way, way north. I've never been to Oxford, Mississippi, which is where uh, Ole Miss is located. Ever since the shredding of Confederate heritage and all that, they do their best to hide their, their background and get rid of their Confederate flags. But it used to be a big deal at Ole Miss. And of course, that is the part of Mississippi that William Faulkner is from. So there's a lot 
of stuff associated with William Faulkner in and around Oxford, Mississippi. It put it was the model for his fictional Yaknapatawpha County. And then there's Corinth, Mississippi. Now Corinth uh, was an important during the during the Second Civil War. Corinth was seen as the crossroads of the Confederacy because you had the main east-west, north-south railroad lines converge there. So the Yankee um, invaders do needed very, very badly to take Corinth. And the result was first the Battle of Shiloh, just over the border in Tennessee, and then the um, uh, siege of Corinth, which was a nasty, nasty bit of business. And ever since then, Corinth, Mississippi has remembered that unpleasant tree very deeply. So that is the great state of Mississippi, which uh, I haven't seen that much of, but I've uh, had a good time every time I've gone there. All right. Thank you for that, Charles. All right. Uh, well, let's let's get to it in terms of um, Pope, uh, Pope Benedict. Um, so one of the things that I had in my library, uh, a book that I've been sitting on for a while, actually, um, is Benedict Sixteenth Last Testament in his own words. Uh, so this is sort of a, a Q&A. This is a, an interview he did with Peter uh, Seawald. And um, this happened in so November 2017th. This was kind of his, I feel like, the, the last hurrah um, as he exits public life completely. Um, so this was like four years after his resignation or something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I'm just going to read a couple a couple different things and use them as talking points. Um, so one of the things um, that I had been struggling with uh, spiritually is whenever I do a meditation on eternity um, and heaven, specifically heaven, right? Um, and you try to use your imagination as best you can. But ultimately, at least for me, I come up with something very um, finite, shall we say, very limited. And then sort of having this finiteness and limited um, picture um, spread across the eternity was always uh, unsettling to me. Um, so just keep that in your mind. So I'm going to read um, uh, the question and answer from his book, uh, kind of that pertains to some of his thoughts on the four last things, right? Um, so the interviewer says, what bears heavily on you? Well, that you have not done enough for people, not treated people rightly. Oh, there are so many details, not very significant things. Thanks be to God. But just so many things where you have to say that something could and should have been done better. So when you stand before the Almighty, what will you say to him? I will plead with him to show leniency toward my wretchedness. Uh, the interviewer says, The believer trusts that eternal life is a life fulfilled. Pope Benedict responds, Definitely. Then he is truly at home. The interviewer asks, What are you expecting? And Pope Benedict responds, There are various dimensions. Some are more theological. St. Augustine says something which is a great thought and a great comfort here. Interprets the passage from the Psalms, quote, seek his face always, as saying, this applies forever to all eternity. God is so great that we never finish our searching. He is always new. With God, there is perpetual unending encounter with new discoveries and new joy. Such things are, the are theological matters. At the same time, in an entirely human perspective, I look forward to being reunited with my parents, my siblings, my friends, and I imagine it will be as lovely as it was at our family home. 
So that uh, that was very touching to me. I, that sort of that was sort of like a gift to me because it sort of solved um, a sort of spiritual or mental problem that I had, where he was he was saying that you know whatever limited vision you have that's that's not accurate. It's new. It's unending new. You know, because my approach was, you know, think of the happiest things in the world that you experience and then sort of put that on loop for infinity. But that's obviously totally whacked, right? Um, So I don't know. The the thought of something that's perpetually new, new discoveries, that um, I feel like that's a really special revelation to sort of unearth. Well, certainly... um... There is no boredom in heaven. Right. And right. I mean, it's, it's Chesterton said it would combine all of the comfort of staying at home with all the excitement of going on a trip. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it certainly can't help, but be better than anything we've known. Um, and all of the drivel, that we've all uh, that we've all been forced to put up with, whether of our own manufacture or otherwise, that will all be gone. Yeah, and, and this this will be like a bad dream. So, what do you what do you feel about Pope Benedict's writings? Some have gone so far as to say, um, I don't know if it was Father Raymond de Souza, I forgot who, uh, who, but that he might even be a doctor of the Church. Would you go that far? Well, no, but I haven't. I haven't read everything he wrote either. Okay. So I'm not going to pretend I'm a uh, I'm a uh, expert on his writing. Uh, the truth is that for me, apart from his his wonderful catech- catechisms, his historical catechetics, where he first dealt with the books of the Bible, this was as Pope. Then he dealt with the uh, fathers of the church one by one. Then he went into the doctors before he resigned. Uh, That was just fascinating stuff. And I remember exploring online each of those as they would happen every week. And I I was really, really fascinated with them because, of course, for me, as an historian, um, my appreciation of philosophy and theology is very much tied to my understanding of history. And he dealt with it in a very historical manner, which was showing the unfolding of the faith and yet its unchangeability. Which, you know, as I've often said before, the uh, Nouvelle, not the Nouvelle Théologie, but the rest was small, went in two different directions. Uh, one of which uh, the late Pope was an expounder was to show the same truth always present in scripture, the fathers, the scholastics, down to what the church teaches today uh, in terms of her uh, infallible teaching. Um, But where he really spoke to me was even more than what he taught It's what he did. Um, It was John Paul II who appointed the Commission of Cardinals who declared upon looking at the evidence that the Latin Mass had never been validly outlawed. Now, he did not promulgate this because, you see, if you promulgate something, you have to do something about it. He didn't promulgate it. But that didn't change the reality of the of the situation. So when Benedict launched the Morum Pontificorum, what he was attempting to do was something that was very masterful, very statesmanlike. He was trying to undo the injustice, because bear in mind, because of that injustice, Hundreds, if not thousands, of clerical careers have been destroyed across the planet. To say nothing of lay people's life and faiths ruined. Um, all because of that injustice perpetrated 
by the hierarchy. But what Benedict was trying to do was to undo the injustice without punishing the malefactors, those who are still around. Uh, his dealing with the Eastern Orthodox, which I think was was just the right manner. And beyond that, his reassumption of various papal symbols and so on gradually over the course of his pontificate, I also thought was very important. Um, now, again, he was a Peritus at Vatican II. And certainly safeguarding the positive side, shall we say, of Vatican II was something that was extremely important to him. Um, and certainly he felt and wrote extensively about this, that the vision of the council, the, the way the council has been seen, was hijacked. Now, unfortunately for us today, we are put into a position by the current Holy Father who has tacitly opposed this vision of continuity versus rupture. Uh, we're put in the position of, okay, who are you going to believe, Benedict or Francis? And that is a horrific position for Catholics to be put in. But that, if you look at Traditiones Custodes and its following uh, documents, that's, the, that's precisely what we're stuck with. Who are you going to believe? And it's, it's, it's made all the more complicated by the fact that the actual machinery of power is now in the hands of those who believe in the hermeneutic of rupture in uh, Pope Benedict's uh, definition. Now, as with Benedict the Ninth, how are we gonna get out of that? I don't know. But as with Benedict the Ninth, I know there will be a solution. Um, I believe that Benedict the Sixteenth was certainly a man of his time. You always got the feeling from him, which you did not get from his predecessor, that he knew what was going on in the trenches, that he knew what the people of God were being subjected to by his hierarchs. Now, he said Samoran Pontificum was not intended tactically. Well, that, whether or not that was true, and I have no reason to doubt he believed what he said. Nevertheless, it did address the injustice without punishing the malefactors, which, if you want to maintain peace and unity, is what you do. That's the whole point of pardoning people, you say. Okay, they were nasty, but we're going to get beyond that, so we can get beyond, so we can keep functioning. Similarly, with um, Anglicanorum Cheribus, in order to bring uh, the Anglo-Catholics home, um, he was willing to embrace a lot of things in and of themselves good and not inherently connected to being separated from Rome. That the Anglicans had either revived from the Middle Ages, developed on their own, or having recovered them from us, had maintained them when we dumped them after Vatican II. All of those things were part of the Anglican patrimony of which he spoke, and which he believed, and I believe, were an important addition to the life of the church, not simply to preserve them as in some sort of museum, but for the purpose of evangelizing the Anglosphere. But of course, we will require um, a holy see that's interested in evangelization in order to take full advantage of those things. Not that they're not being taken advantage of now by the ordinary uh, communities, but um, 
the problem is in today's church, everyone who is not everyone who is not identified as having difficulties with doctrine or morals has to look over their shoulder constantly for fear of being smacked around. This is not healthy. The very people who are really the only ones interested in doing the work of the church should not be the ones who have to worry about being jumped on. That's simply wrong. You know, it, when when you will hear members of a Catholic institution fearfully say we can't be too orthodox, there's something basically wrong with that. Right. I mean, that's um. Well, bringing it back to Pope Benedict, um, part of his legacy, the the number is um. I mean, he cracked down on the sexual abuse in a big way. Um, they kind of reviewed how he did a lot of things. Ended up defrocking, I guess the number is a little under 700 priests. So that, um, and it was interesting in this book to hear him comment about this, about his approach to these things. Um, so it's interesting the differences in approach. I, I couldn't help but um, but do a compare and contrast um, as I watch the funeral, you know, um, and and listen to the commentary with the approach of, you know, bringing, you know, Pope Benedict's legacy is bringing the church in. And right now we have so many different things happening where it seems to be fracturing the church, to be quite honest. Um, well, you know, the, the problem is right now, I mean, we've just had the Father Rupnik SJ case, which continues. Uh, per, pervs and criminals have the have the sway in many areas in the Holy See, and it's become public. Well, guess what? You know, you you do not suppress abuses by putting abusers in charge. That actually doesn't work. You know, you don't suppress piracy by hiring Somali pirates to suppress it. You you don't suppress the mafia by putting um, mafiosi in charge of the FBI. That actually doesn't work. See, if you, if you uh, have a flock of sheep and you use wolves instead of sheepdogs, guess what's going to happen? But, you know, as, as dismal as, as things are and, and what's going on, um, again, going back to uh, to the funeral, you know, it was interesting because it, it was very sad in a sense um, because of the context. Because so Pope Francis is Pope Emeritus, right? So the um, the dignitaries, the heads of state, you know, it wasn't that sort of event for no. them. So it was very uh, not well attended, by them. Um, I think for John Paul II's funeral, they said something like 2 million people went were in St. Peter's Square. Um, when they did the overview, it was it was a kind of a cold, a little bit rainy day, I think a little wet. Um, and, you know, there were, St. Peter's Square was not completely full uh, on the back end, which kind of made me sad. Well, but I, it, it was fuller than it is normally today. But, the the one thing that stood out uh, to me was how many how many priests were there. There was this giant section uh, of priests, and um, I guess they, they con celebrate. I I didn't know masses could be con celebrated on that level. So there are something like thirty nine hundred priests there, and they showed um, they showed all the priests there, and I was so confused because. All the priests were like my age, mm -hmm. and I and I was like I I don't I don't get it like the church like that's not the demographic of the church right now, and it, it you know I kept thinking about it because it bothered me like where are the all young priests, and then it hit me, all the priests that went there, 
were the priests that were inspired to probably the people who be, were inspired to become priests by Pope Benedict. Yeah. Those are the people who made the trek. So to me, that was a sign of hope. You know? And uh, yeah, and, and of course, don't forget also that younger priests would be busy working. <laughs> but I, I, no, I mean, seriously, it, it, it's true. Uh, there, you don't find, you find a lot of priests who were inspired to become priests by Benedict. You don't find many who have been inspired to become priests by Francis. Right. I, that's, you wonder about that, you know, because, you know, um, there was also obviously a generation that cites John Paul II. Yeah. Um, and, you know, each pope is such a huge factor in terms of generating the priests, you know, for a generation, you know. Um, so there was that thought. Um, well, I, I mean, the traditional and more conservative orders and dioceses continue to get priests, but not because of Pope Francis. Right. All right. Um, so one, um, one more thing I'd like to comment on the the super one one of the superpowers so obviously everybody knows benedict's humility um and also kind of charity charity a little bit a little bit of charity but you know it really stands out in his writing sometimes i remember i was reading um i highly recommend the jesus of nazareth series um some a lot of priests say that's going to be read for hundreds of years um Maybe so. I don't know. I'm not smart enough theologically to make that determination. But, um, you know, the way he attacks people is so funny because it's literally in the most charitable way possible. Where he's talking about people are totally whacked out on their interpretation of Jesus or certain events. And the way he says it is, um, I, I remember the way he said it was, uh, these people value theory over listening to the text and listening, reading. In other words, brother, your head's in the clouds. You have no basis in scripture. Nowhere in scripture does that say that. They'd be tripping. They'd be tripping. <laughs> You'd be tripping, man. So that was Pope Benedict's version of saying that. Uh, and I thought that was so. It was so fun. I've never, heard, I've never heard or read anyone talk like that before, where they're defending something, but in the most charitable way possible. Um, so um, we get to a question where the interviewer asks, "How was it with Obama?" Ooh. What is he going to say? And um, Pope Benedict says, a great politician, of course. <laughs> it's kind of a double double meaning there. Who knows what it takes to be successful? Uh, excuse me. He uh, a great politician, of course, who knows what it takes to be successful <laughs> and, has certain and has certain ideas that we cannot share. But he was not only a tactician to me, but certainly a reflective man, too. I felt that he s sought the meeting between us and that he listened. So not a lot to say, right? Kind of, kind of, uh, you know, he said what he could. I think, I think you can tell that, like. Yeah, well, and of course, you know, his, his request that Biden specifically not be at the funeral was kind of telling. Did he say that? Wow, I didn't know that. But um, no, it's what it was was first whispered, and then the White House confirmed it. Okay, that's good to know. That's really good to know, uh, because that would be a political move, no doubt, right, on Biden's part. Um, but um, however, Biden did per did perform public penance in front of the uh, National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. 
Did he? No. No. Nice try, Charles. Uh, that 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 was a bridge too far for me. That was uh, a bridge too far. That was. No, I, I, you you, you got to be more conservative else. on these. Um, but no. But anyhow, I just I just like that the way he identified the difference with Obama. Like, quite simply, we cannot share your ideas. That's all there is to it. You know, um, and. I don't know. I, I I just really aspire to that in in an age where we're saying things on Twitter where we're we're using the word fraternal correction, but then it's like we let loose. Um, you you made a post on this right where um civility and um you don't need to go for the jugular all the time. That's the word no, you used. I remember that I, right. Like and it's it's true. Although I have to admit. Uh, Massimo Fagioli wrote something on Twitter. I forget what it was now, but when I read it, I mean, I was just really annoyed. So I wrote in response, um, I make it a rule never to use ad hominems against the non-powerful, but you test me sorely. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> I've never seen you write anything like that on Twitter. <laughs> Well, what he wrote, I mean, again, now it's out of my gate. It's, it's, you know, flushed out with all the other detritus. <laughs> but uh, it was just so stupid, even for him. Uh, but I, I didn't, I didn't say what I wanted to say. Because, you know, very often, I mean, the very fact that I don't remember what it was about shows you it couldn't have been that important, number one. Number two, I meant what I said. Save your ad hominems for people who are stronger than you are. People who are as weak and useless as you are, there's no point. And if you're like the vast majority of people, your opinions don't matter, as with me, as with just about everyone on Twitter, don't get excited. All right. Um, but if they're powerful, have at them. I'm going to do. I'm going to gratuitously go into two of my favorite quotes from Pope Benedict, um, kind of quasi quotes, quotes uh, because people have corrected me that he didn't write this word for word, but it's kind of a little bit of an adaptation, if you will. Uh -huh. um, but I, I would feel remiss if I didn't say this because it's just so inspirational that I want these quotes to impact other people in the way they've impacted me. Um, so quote number one, um, he, Pope Benedict says, holiness does not consist in never having erred or sinned. Holiness increases the capacity for conversion, for repentance, for willingness to start again, and especially for reconciliation and forgiveness. So in other words, it's the striving to, you know, d to do good and to repent. You know what I mean? So this is sort of a thought that I try to take into uh, e or, or coming away with in each confession, after each confession, right? Where you strive, like never again, right? Like I, I believe um, I can start again and I'm willing to start again fresh, um, and so I sort of latch on to this quote um, in that regard. Um, the other quote I, I actually have memorized. I don't need to refer to it. Um, it he simply says, um, again, adapted a little bit, but the world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. Yeah. <sighs> That that gets me. There is that is such a simple statement, but unpacking that, like you could write dozens of pages to unpack that. Um, Again, and of course, if you will, it's a very chivalric thing to say, uh, very knightly. And the and perhaps that's why it strikes a chord in me so much is because this world is the opposite of that, right? With, yeah. uh, and, and the world, it's offering you comfort at every turn. It's offering you the path of least resistance 
at every turn. Yeah. And you have to reject that, though, in order to achieve greatness. And not greatness like Michael Jordan greatness or, or Ronald Reagan greatness or a CEO of some company greatness or some social activism greatness, but greatness um, d- d- uh, giving, um, doing God's will oh. in the little things and the, executing God's plan for you. Um, I, I just, I, that is the quote that I try to model my life after, honestly, that I kind of, that I continually have to hold on to because I, I've always got the comforts of the world creeping up. Right. Well, I mean, as, <laughs> as do we all. And of course you don't want to lose them. You yeah. Know? Um, so it, be, it does become very, very difficult. And I, and again, you know, it's it's a huge contrast to so much of what we hear today, uh, which basically tells us you were not made for greatness; you were made for comfort. Right. Um, and that, and you hear that in church and state constantly. I mean, in a sense, that's what the COVID scare was all about. Right. Uh, you know, the Great Reset. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's interesting, but this book, it's actually, I, I wish I could do a plug, but it's actually out of stock everywhere. Um, because obviously everyone's bought it up. You can't even get it on Amazon right now. Um, I'll bring up a, another talking point, that one that you might be interested in. Um, one of the things I did, um, I was always confused about with, benedict was that he called carl runner a great theologian i mean i guess at some point in time and i never understood that like i wanted to understand that but i based off the just the things the errors that have come out of him that i know i i just couldn't couldn't do it um but admittedly i guess there was a falling out i guess um who who's the hans kuhn he had a falling out with two Hans Kung apparently attacked him, uh, attacked Benedict. And, um, and this was after Benedict invited him to lunch. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'd like to think that Benedict sort of grew out of a phase. Well, I mean, basically when I look at Benedict, I look at him as the sort of counter John the 23rd Hmm. in the sense that, John the Twenty Third was basically a uh, orthodox, conservative, traditional fellow who was pushed leftward by life experiences. Benedict, in the beginning, was kind of a revolutionary theologian, but he too was pushed rightward by life experiences. Uh, though experiences which people like Kering and Rahner refused to accept realities they refuse to accept and where you see the formation of the two schools was in the formation of communio see uh, in the wake of the council of this theological journal run by the ronerites which everybody originally was part of including uh the then ratzinger was called concilium but concilium was going off in a wild and uh, heterodox way Mm. And so Ratzinger and a number of other people of the Nouvelle Theologie who were opposed to that started Communio. Mm. And it's from that time that there was a rupture between Ratzinger and his former comrades on the barricades. Um, And then, of course, when he became Pope, apart from the grace of the office, uh, being a truly humble man, he felt the responsibilities of the office, which, again, this is a modern problem, not just in the church, but in every area. The idea that an office, that the, the holder of an office does not have carte blanche to do whatever he likes to reinvent it, but that has, rather he has an obligation, if he's going to hold it, to subject himself to it 
and two, the well-being of the institution that it that it uh, that that office is part of. I mean, you know, if if I'm if I'm become the the uh, president of a college of a small liberal arts college for boys for men that specializes in the liberal arts. It doesn't have business. It doesn't have this. It doesn't have that. It's very particular. I have an obligation to pass it on the way I found it. Or better. More successful. What I do not have the right to do, although I may very well do it if I'm a modern person, is to reshape it the way I think it should be. If I don't like the vision of a given institution as it is, then I should get out of that institution and do something of my own. Mm. I mean, uh, during the great wave of wokery, after uh, the hot, hot summer of burning love in 2020, when you had all of these different institutions in the United States, literally attacking their own founders. You know what? Those board members, presidents, vice presidents, etc., who felt that way, they should have resigned. Hmm. And they should have, you know, started their own thing with their own brilliance, which doubtless would be much better than the original, and do something wonderful all on their own because they're so brilliant and stuff. Hmm. Well, Benedict, despite being a very humble man, knew that the church needs a pope. It doesn't need a dictator. It doesn't need a facilitator. It doesn't need an arch community songster. It needs a pope. It needs a vicar of Christ. And that sometimes means subordinating your own inclinations to the office. And so, despite being a very shy man, a man who didn't like limelight, he took it. And as I've said, um, people responded. There were actually more pilgrims to Rome in his time than in John Paul II's. Wow. That's good to know. Well, that's because people knew whether they, I mean, it's not that he was a quote unquote better man than John Paul II, but John Paul II was very much a personality. I mean, whatever he did, he would have been a personality. If yeah. he had been your, your local butcher store owner, there'd have been lines around the block. Of course. Of course. He had a certain magnetism. But with Benedict, all you got was the papacy. But see, that's all we needed. The father of the of the flock who seeks to gather, not to scatter, and that's a lesson that's lost on many many modern people in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I I I hate to say this, but my strength is waning. We understand, Charles. We absolutely understand. Um, Thank you for doing this. Um, again, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Charles is still very much recuperating. Um, so, but hopefully you'll be much better next week. One hopes. Um, one thing I should I should touch on before we break off, simply because it happened, and that was I saw the king's first Christmas message. Oh, what do you think? I, I liked it. I, lo I loved it. Politicians do not talk like that. I love all the um, the cite citing his faith. Um, uh, he, well, mentioning he, our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Uh, I, I, you know, a lot of your words come back to me when he talks. Most particularly when you say monarchy is personal, mm. and he. You know, the other thing, too, is that he's in the position for something like that. On the one hand, he's got to somehow appeal to as many of his subjects as he can. 
But on the other, he has to make some kind of witness to his personal faith. And I think he, he struck a good balance between the two in this speech. Absolutely. Humility and charity is something that um, and he even said. I think he, he, he said, you know, whether you're this or that or even if you have no faith. You know, um, so he's truly a, I don't know. It, it seemed very paternal for the whole nation. Yeah. And I really, um, it was a new feeling, you know? Well, it was very different from the queen because, of course, she felt very much like, uh, don't be shocked, like a mother. And everybody's a mother today. Right. <laughs> That's why we were all shepherded right into our homes during COVID. But. To have a, a touch of paternity, that was kind of refreshing. And as I say, I was very pleased about his mentioning this was the birthplace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as told in the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. And that shot of him right staring at the uh, the birthplace of Christ in Bethlehem. Mm. I mean, could you imagine anybody else in political life doing that? No. No. It... Um, so we'll see if we have a new Caroline age. <laughs> I, uh, well, you know, when he took the name Charles III, I was kind of happy because uh, sometime before there'd been all this discussion that he'd be called George VII and all that because Charles immediately reminds you of Charles I, uh, who, of course, was beheaded. Charles II, the merry monarch who didn't get along with Parliament. And, of course, the other Charles III, Bonnie Prince Charlie. Hmm. But the fact that he decided to take the name Charles III, despite everything, one can only hope that it shows a certain sympathy for his Stuart forebears. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right. Hope I've you guys... got a question. Okay. I've got a Yuletide question Wait, for you. What, okay, what question? What is it if it's Monday? It's off the menu. What about the Soyuz safe? It may be your own. See you Merry next Christmas. Time. Happy New Year. See you guys.